speaker with uh, Raphael Lalive. Welcome, Raphael. Thank you for this uh, op a possibility to present this paper here. I, I put down ESLE virtual. I would have loved it would have been real as as everyone, but uh, but this is this is running really good. And thank you to the organizers. It it, it works well. So. This paper goes towards uh, and is, you know, related to to the previous paper in the sense that uh, we're all going, uh, we're also going to think, be thinking about uh, uh, gender composition. It was gender representation in Melanie's case. Um, so let me go straight to what it is. Uh, we're going to look at firms' gender preference, and this is the preference expressed in job ads. Now. Um, First, just two observations. Um, many firms, or let's better say teams, are not very balanced in terms of gender. Some are, some are not. Uh, the team that is working on this paper, David Card, Fabrizio, and I, we're not, uh, you know, we, we're not gender balanced at all. Um, and at the same time, there are ways for job ads to express uh, gender preference, right, right through the wording. Uh, we're not going to look at the wording of job ads. It's going to be an explicit, you know, <laughs> just zero one gender preference. But let's think about this. You know, some some in some cases we we actually state we want the worker for a particular gender. Now these job ads or gender statements they can be conditional on quality, and uh, it's perhaps safe to say that many many academic institutions um, have statements in their job ads that say if you know at equal quality, we will um, basically uh, select women to further encourage uh, and, and foster gender balance. I'm gonna talk about a kind of gender statement or preference statement that strikes us a little bit odd now. It's an absolute statement. It says that, uh, you know, we want a man, or we want a woman on this job, period. But, you know, remember in, in our settings, this used to be very common in, in the US until 1964 when the um, anti-discrimination legislation outlawed these kinds of statements. And in, in Europe, I would say it's, it's been a process in the 90s and 2000s now to, to, to sort of uh, address this type of gender statement. There's a very uh, excellent line of research by Peter Kuhn and co-authors on China where many areas allow uh, absolute gender statements. And what we're going to do here today is we're asking whether this type of absolute gender preference statement has effects on hiring behavior. It says segregation here on the slide. We're going to be a bit, little bit, um, 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 you know, a bit, bit larger than that, but we're, we're basically going to look at, you know, what is the function of these ads? And we're doing this in the setting um, Austria, Austria used to, this is, you know, a, a regular um, uh, labor market uh, in, in Europe and gender statements used to be actually quite common. And then what we'll see is, is sort of, uh, you know, in the middle of our sample period, there's this, uh, there's this band that um, basically abolishes stating gender preference. It's in 2004. And what we'll use is, is data on the stated gender preference of firms workplace gender composition, and then especially, especially we're going to, to focus on the gender of new hires. So right now, you know, these, these policies could have many effects, and, and, and some of them were already, uh, you know, uh, talked about by, by Melanie. She talked about, you know, uh, there could be diversity considerations. Um, there could, a whole, could be a whole range of considerations. What we're going to do today is we're just going to show you how we think we can identify the effects of saying, I'd like to have a man for this job, or I'd like to have a woman for this job, and how this might this feedback into segregation. Okay, so let me go into the background of this. So in, in German, many job titles basically transmit a specific gender. So if you'd like to hire a baker and you say baker, then everybody in German would understand this to be a man. You'd have to say bakeress for this to be a woman. Now I'm just stating that because Austria is our context and many people, you know, their, their official language is, 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 is German. There are other languages that have this, but basically, you know, if without paying some active attention to gender equality in Austria, you would 
basically implicitly making a, a gender preference statement. And maybe not surprisingly, in 2000, in the time before um, the um, policy was implemented that, that we look at, about 60% of all the, uh, the ads that were um, you know, investigated stated a specific gender preference for the job. Now, in 2002, the EU passed a directive that urges every member country to uh, do everything it can to uh, address discrimination. And Austria implemented basically this directory, uh, this directive in 2004 in an act that's quite comprehensive. It's called the Austrian Equal Treatment Act in 2004. Now, let me uh, give you just an extract of uh, Title I, Section 9, which is a ban on state agenda preference. Uh, this was effective July 2004. And what we see there is that the Equal Treatment Act sta states fines of 360 euros per job ad for anyone publishing an ad with a gender preference statement after July 2004. And this is immediate if it's, you know, uh, an, uh, an organization of the state, if it's the public employment service, um, then, um, and the private re recruiters, uh, then they have to, to pay that immediately. Uh, for private firms, there's some delay. Uh, there's a warning period first. You can publish one ad, forget about, you know, removing the gender statement. And then a uh, second time you get caught, you have to pay for this. There are also damages for job applicants. Typically, you know, a portion of a monthly wage, if um, you can uh, credibly illustrate that you were discriminated based on gender. And I'm stating this just because all of Europe basically has implemented laws of this kind, but, uh, but Austria is, uh, is, is apparently one of the few that, that actually uh, saw specific um, damages and, and, and payments to, to enforce this act. So that's the setting. Um, you know, there's some good sides on it. It, it, it limits state of gender preference. There's some bad sides. It affects all of the country, and we'll, we'll talk about that further on. So let me talk about the, the data we're using. We're using um, data that is provided by the Arbeit Smart Service, AMS, recruiting platform. It's a recruiting platform mostly used by the Public Employment Service. It's been built in 1987, and it basically collects information on the open vacancies by employers. The coverage is 60%, which is fairly good in, uh, uh, in European comparisons. The same number is about 20% uh, in Switzerland. And say France would have a sim similar number. So it's, we don't have all the vacancies in the country, but uh, around 60%. Uh, now, one thing that is important for the way we interpret uh, the results we provide afterwards is that it's basically mainly caseworkers that uh, access this uh, data source and they use it to, um, in, their, in their regular meetings with the job seekers to talk about possible job applications. So this is information that is provided to the intermediaries at the labor market. Job seekers can also access this uh, database at you know, these old terminals that uh, we used to have in public employment service units before the internet came. And we're definitely looking at a period where the internet is, uh, you know, it's just uh, starting to be used. The key information we get from this data is basically, it's, uh, it's, it's an explicit statement of whether the employer expects applications by men or by women or uh, by, you know, no, uh, no preferred gender stated. So of course, as an employer, you, 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 you can leave open the gender requirement, but you can also fill it in. And we'll see that about two, four out of 10 employers are doing this before the abolishment of the um, possibility to provide a gender statement. There is also a checkbox that says, you know, if this vacancy is for a trained worker, 
or whether it's an apprenticeship. So in that sense, there is also uh, an age preference, but this is more like a, an education requirement preference on the job. So we are not really looking at this in, in the paper. Now, what we can also get from this data source is the ID of the worker. Um, if the job has been filled through the public employment service. So, um, you know, we have about six out of 10 uh, vacancies going into the system. And out of those, it's about, you know, a uh, short 20 or 30% that are served by the public employment service. And everything I'll talk about is, is exactly about those, those uh, vacancies because we can know everybody, every, we can know many things about the workers hired on these vacancies, but we don't know anything about wor uh, workers hired on other vacancies uh, without additional, a, a lot of additional work. We also have education, occupation, region on these people and further information. All right, so what we do after, so what we can do is we can directly uh, see which worker is hired through the public employment service. And then we can also um, look at uh, the uh, firms that hire these people. So for AMS hires, we look at the gender of the hired worker. We also have additional information that we're waiting to explore like earnings and employment spells to tell us more about the efficiency of the matches that have been that are being created, but progress is slow. So today we're not going to be able to say much about that, but we will we'll say a lot about the, the effects on, on, on who gets hired. So what we, what we focus on here is, is very much on the gender um, composition of the firm that hires the worker. We also look at the gender composition to understand which firms post uh, uh, a gender preference for women, which firms post them for men. So that's why we match this uh, public employment service data that is you know, at the individual level, also with the firms that have posted these um, job vacancies. And we use, um, we use basically both the, the, the uh, identifier of firms, but also the pattern of hiring in, in particular firms if we cannot uh, find, find uh, firm identifiers. But these firms, think of them as being really, you know, uh, teams about the size that uh, we have, we three, the co-authors on this paper. So the firm size is about, uh, the, 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 the average firm size is about 11, but there's also many small firms in this uh, beta. Okay, so this is a, a table that basically says uh, by matching, you know, ever, ever smaller cells of Austria, we're doing, uh, we're, we're losing representativity. That's, that's for sure. We, you, can't, uh, you can't get something without uh, losing something. So um, column one here is basically sort of the universe of, of, of vacancies that are being filled. Column two is uh, the vacancies that are filled, being filled by a hire. That's you know, our target universe. That's actually what we are, are looking at. Column three, those are the ones served by the public employment service. And one thing you can, you can see clearly here is that they are not representative in terms of education. We have 52% uh, of the workers that are being hired uh, on, uh, the, uh, on these jobs. They have, so 52% of the vacancies that are being filled have an upper uh, education requirement that is upper secondary. And if we look at column three, the same number, um, then uh, we see that um, there's only 46% uh, of the, the jobs that are filled through the AMS have an upper secondary education requirement. So it's more lower education jobs. And that's not surprising because the public employment service is you know, offering people who are uh, looking for jobs and those tend to have lower education attainments than the general population. So that's not representative, but then in terms of other aspects, whether it's a small firm, a full-time position, an unlimited contract, these uh, proportions don't change very much. So it's really the, just the, 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 the skill requirement on the job that is, that is really different. 
Now, if you look at the fourth column, so the fourth column, that's the sample we are working with. That's the one that's matched to firms. So three is all hires through the public employment service. Four is only those with firm information. Here, pretty much everything stays the same. And that's basically because we uh, manage to, to, to match a fair amount of these jobs. Okay, so um, let me go into a first descriptive analysis. What I'll basically focus on is just giving you some uh, uh, first assessment of what this uh, stated gender preference actually does in the labor market. Um, I'd like to start out with um, just a, a histogram of the gender composition of workplaces. So you can see the, um, the, 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 the beige cold bars, <laughs> colored bars. That's the gender composition in 1999. And you see a sort of a U shape, which means at the left, there's many firms that, have, that are exclusively female, almost 10% of the whole sample. To the right, we also have many firms that are exclusively male, 8%. And in between, we have a sort of a, somewhat a uniform um, distribution. But something happened. So 1999 is before the law was passed. 2007, this is the, the solid uh, uh, empty um, bars here, that uh, dark, uh, black empty bars here. Um, you can see there are more um, more firms with uh, an, an all female share. So the, the, the horizontal line is the share of female workers per firm. So we have more firms with female workers. And you can see this is throughout the, the, the case throughout the distribution from 50% to about 100%. So something seems to have been happening here. This is just uh, what this graph is been sh showing. What I'd like to talk you through is now just um, basically just a conceptual um, thought about how to link the current share of women in the workplace with the new women hired uh, or men hired in the firm. So uh, the first bullet points are just uh, definitions. N is the number of people. F is the share of women at the workplace. The segregation index is not relevant for today, but basically now what's important is whether a woman is uh, hired on the new vacancy I, or uh, then we um, say this H is one and whether, and if not, then it's zero. So H is basically the gender uh, of, the, of, the new, of a new person hired. Now, then you can say that, you know, the number of women hired in, um, in the firm is uh, whether a firm, whether a woman is hired in the firm or not, it, that depends on the new hire relative to the actual number of um, uh, in the, uh, women in the firm. And so the change in the share of female, that's the main objective here, is basically the, um, the new share female, FJT, is the lagged share female plus the share of women in, the, uh, in my new hires. And so what we are going to look at now is just the, the, the dynamics of the share female, um, whether the new hire is a, a woman or a man. And we, we, we look at this in terms of the past share of women. This here is just a graph that illustrates the situation, a hypothetical situation that says, you know, nothing in this labor market is going to change. We have workplaces from 0% women to 1% women on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we see the likelihood that a new vacancy is served is, is, uh, is, is a given a new hire is a woman. And if that goes one for one, equal proportion with the, uh, the share female in the workplace, then nothing will happen. And I'm going to show you this graph, you know, uh, two, three times just to, 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 to fix ideas. This is a situation where definitely the share of women will increase in all the workplaces. So here, regardless of what the current share of women is, the proportion of uh, women hired is 90% or, or more. So we're going to converge to a situation where all the workplaces are going to uh, converge more to the right and have more women. And this could be also slower, right? Uh, this is not uh, the previous case is, is an extreme. 
and the same it, it's it's for men you know if you have uh, if you hire very few men and uh, um, if you hire very few women regardless of your current share female then you're going to converge to a situation where there's more workplaces at the lower end where the uh, which are all male Okay, so I, I've shown you this just to, so we can look at one of the graphs that we um, really discovered in this project. And um, it's one that relates whether a vacancy is hiring a woman. And then we have the share of women in the workplace last year. Workplace and firm is the same thing in, 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 uh, in the language of this, uh, in our language. And uh, what kind of uh, preference the workplace stated. So we have red for women. So this is a, a we have vacancy based data. So that's a vacancy that said we would like to hire a woman on this vacancy. Um, orange is no preference and blue would be uh, the vacancy said we would like to hire a man. And so what we end up getting here, if we look at uh, our data is sort of a sign that some of us uh, will remember as you know uh, being like the z in the zero um we have you know the the red firms they all stated we'd like to hire a woman and they are actually doing this you know at 90 percent to 100 percent. so those firms if they're using stated gender preference all the time to say they'd like a woman they're going to converge to 100 percent share of women we have the the blue dots those are the ones that said we'd like to hire a man. And here we see, you know, the, the share of women hired is very, very low. It's actually it doesn't stay zero all the time. It's, it's very close to zero until 60% share of uh, female employed actually in the workplace. But then it starts rising. And uh, so these workplaces uh, don't manage to, to stick to, to what, what their, their statement as much as, as the workplaces that wanted women, the red ones. And then in the immediate in, in the intermediate range, you see that there's um, the orange uh, workplaces. They said we don't know. I mean, we don't we don't have an explicit state uh, preference. What happens there is they basically replicate their current um, share of employment. Okay, so the, these are these are three different strategies. If those were three different types of firms we would have, um, you know, we have a composite effect where there's some workplaces with lots of men, some with lots of women and some in between. But before I go, so this is just a slide that's, that, that discusses based on pr prior evidence, how this works. Well, in the Austrian context, it's, it's actually very simple. If you say you'd like uh, a position to um, uh, be given to a woman, then the, the caseworker at the uh, local employment service will most likely um, uh, um, basically uh, offer you or send you uh, people that, that satisfy this criterion directly. But it also works in, in a more competitive uh, labor market context, mainly through people applying only to the jobs that state their gender. So that's the, the, the compliance of applicants and firms typically enforce what they, what they say. Now comes a question. Another question is, so who states gender, pre gender preference? Um, gender preference could be used to integrate, right? If you are uh, uh, a workplace, an all-male firm like our team, uh, David, Fabrizio and I, if we would maybe love to have a state of gender preference and say, okay, a new collaborator must be female. So that would be, a way of using the state of gender preference to integrate. Um, but of course, you can also use it to segregate. And if we um, go and look at what actually happens in the real world, then we have to say most firms use it to segregate. So this graph just shows you in the same uh, colors as uh, previously, which types of firms are using uh, state of gender preference. And so the red dots, basically, th those are the ones saying we'd like to hire uh, a woman instead of not saying anything that's uh, orange or instead of saying a man and the higher the um, share of women in the workplace is the more likely it is that the firm will use it to say we want another woman 
So that's going to reinforce uh, segregation more likely. But there's all there, there are off uh, diagonal um, firms. So all firms below the 50% share female um, by stating that they were, those are all male workplaces by stating that they would like a, a woman, they're going to converge more to 50% and to be more integrated. Um, so, so this is descriptively uh, compliance with state gender preference is very high. That's the Zorro graph. Um, gender preference is in line with gender composition, but um, sometimes we see firms that counter gender composition. So, so I'd like, I, I've, I've shown you that to basically um, show you more about the, the, the challenges to actually learn about the effect of this, this uh, policy. What you see here is basically the, the share of uh, vacancies that are stating a gender. The dashed line is, is the policy. And then, you know, the, the rose colored is, is female is preferred, um, blue is male is preferred. You see it's, it's 20, 25%. It's, it's not everything by no means, but it's a sizable portion of the, of the labor market. And then comes the law and it takes a while for it to actually uh, bite. And we think of this as, you know, taking, being uh, implemented with some lag with firms still advertising, but then after one or two years, um, the share of vacancies with the gender statement uh, basically disappears completely. So that's, you know, there, something happened here. Um, now, how do we uh, analyze this? And how do we uh, analyze whether this uh, affects firms hiring decisions? Now, one thing we, we realized is that, you know, if we, you show that a, a firm hires a woman on a vacancy that says women should be hired, uh, that's something that's now well known from Peter Kuhn's work that that actually works. I mean, that, that, that definitely has an effect. But our question here is more, what if you take this tool away uh, to the entire workplace? What is the effect of that? And that's what we think of the effect of, of, of the policy. We limit, we take a firm, it has 60% uh, women, and we, we, this firm can no longer advertise a, a particular gender on a new hire. What's the effect here? So we uh, do this by classifying firms by the use of state agenda preference. There's just one small problem. We have many small firms. <laughs> so that's a big problem that we have many small firms. And uh, of course the data on standard gender preference is available only before the ban. So what we do here is we, um, we uh, generate the way to predict what a firm would have said, you know, uh, I'd like a man, I'd like a woman on the, position or nothing. And we do this with the gender composition at the workplace, that's, that's F, and it's always the previous year, so there's no, no interference with the current hiring. And then we use industry. It's a proxy for firm. We have industries in, in 87 categories, also 38 categories, and we build cells. It's uh, just within each cell, we basically look at what the behavior was in the 2000 to 2003 period. That's before the policy was put in place. And so the um, beta fi here, that those are just cell averages of whether um, uh, uh, a firm has been a net, uh, uh, has been on net hiring women, hiring men, or hiring, giving no preference. Because S S is an index that's just one if you stated that you'd like to hire a woman. It's zero if you'd like to have no gender statement and minus one if it's, it's the man. Rafael? Yes? Yes, this is Thomas. May I ask a quick question here? So, so why, why don't you use occupation rather than industry? So that's a very good question. Um, in, we will use this to, to basically highlight why the changes come about. That's exactly what we're, so the thing is, so, so occupation is something you choose as the firm. And, uh, and yesterday I learned that industry is also something you choose, but we think of this as basically as, as being something that is in a, in a short time frame sort of fixed and allows us to, to identify the, 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 the unit that makes the decision. And so occupation is precisely one of the, ch one of the channels that could uh, explain the results we, we show afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how do we predict uh, gender preference? We have the share of women F and industry for all the workplaces. 
throughout the entire sample. So this is, you know, cheap trick. So we can predict what you would have done. And uh, for uh, vacancies after the ban, we do it like this. The problem is if we use some data to characterize what industries would do, and then also predict what they will do, then we have overfitting. And we, we um, basically use a, a simple leave one out um, procedure to, to reduce that. And that seems to work actually quite well. So this graph basically uh, just gives you an idea of the data we have in terms of and how we predict the, the, the gender preference. We have the lag chair females, that's the, the horizontal axis and all the data points, those are the different industries in the vertical uh, domain. And then um, on the on the and then the, we predict this index S, which is one if you only post the chairs ads for women, and minus one if you only posted ads for men. Uh, in all of these cells, and then we, we we impute that, and at the end of the day we go back and just you know classify every firm into whether it has. Uh, would have stated a preference for men, for a uh, woman on the new vacancy. That's one. And then zero, it's neutral minus one. And let me show you now just, you know, the, the basic difference in difference result on that one. Now this, um, this uh, first, what is the axis on the horizontal? That's net female hires. If the number is positive, 0.03, for instance, this means you have been hiring 3% more women than, uh, uh, you have been hiring more women than men. It, it, it doesn't, and um, uh, three percentage points, exactly. And, and negative means more, more men. Okay, now at uh, the top, you see uh, the predicted uh, gender preference effects. So male gender preference, that's the minus one I showed you on the previous graph. And you can see a wonder, or maybe no wonder, uh, it's, it's a reduction in the number of, uh, th these firms hire more men than women. It's, it, there's a negative main effect. The female SGP, that's also the main effect for those firms that we classify as being those who want to hire women and they do actually hire more women. If you go down to the treatment effects, that's the comparison between after the graph and before, after the ban and before the ban, you can basically see that um, the impacts here are, basically the treatment effects undo the main effects. What this means overall is that the abolishing standard preference has reduced, uh, has, has basically undone the possibility for firms to to, uh, to, to use stated gender preference to hire particular groups of women. Now, um, here we also see uh, the evolution over time. Uh, the policy has worked better for those male environments that um, would have uh, wanted to hire uh, another male collaborator. That's the blue line. It didn't work so much uh, or so well for those um, vacancies that, that wanted to hire a woman. Now, um, we also said, thought about the, situ the situation once more. And we said, you know, we really have to make a distinction between those who would like to hire women. Those were uh, the group one. And um, here we, we now say, okay, there's a one minus one. And they're in line with their, their share of uh, women that are employed. And then there's a quadrant two and minus two. There's very few observations, we know that. But um, those are actually stating a preference that is counter to the current workplace composition. Well, can, can, sorry, uh, can I ask yeah. something about the previous graph? I mean, one, one, uh, one possible concern is some, some mean reversion. Have you, done, have you done this with using other years as kind of placebos? Yes, so we, we have done placebos also uh, using the very limited uh, before time period and also some, uh, some years in, uh, afterwards. And, and we, we're pretty confident that uh, trends are very, very essential, but, but we, we've, we've, we've worked a lot on, on studying that, yeah. And we, we don't think this is basically just driven by, by uh, differential trends, yeah. All right, so one thing that's important here in this 
second graph where we classify the firms again is we'd like to classify them in terms of their uh, composition. So two is, is a male firm, but is advertising for uh, women. And minus two is, is a female firm advertising for men. And we'd like to understand what these um, different um, impacts are on these firms. Um, so here uh, we, uh, so here we classified firms in those five different uh, places. So you can see in the main effects in the top column, um, those two groups that wanted to hire men, um, that's uh, the, the, those who advertise men in a female workplace and in a male workplace, they tend to be more likely to hire men. No state of gender preference is the reference. And then those who advertise for women, they actually, uh, they, they tended to hire more women. But one thing you see is th those who are in the off diagonal, those who use the signal to hire in what is not in line with the current composition, their impacts, their effects are actually much, much bigger. So that's, that's the baseline in the pre-period. And then we have the treatment effects in the period after the uh, ban uh, ruled out the state agenda preference. And what we see here is that, you know, uh, those who have a male gender preference in female workplaces, their signals still pretty much appear to work for the other groups. And especially for those who advertise for women in male workplaces, there's, there's a very large and negative effect. So there, the possibility of these uh, uh, firms in uh, advertising for uh, women in male workplaces has, gone down considerably. So with this, you know, we'd just like to highlight, yes, stating a gender preference seems to have to contribute to segregation. I haven't given you numbers yet, but um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a way of using this state of gender preference that has also led to more integration. It's been a smaller force, but that one has disappeared um, definitely as for those who uh, wanted to hire women in, in male workplaces. Now, I, I, uh, um, I wanted to also show you who those industries are, the industries of those workplaces. So the first part panel here, A, those are um, workplaces that we classify as wanting to advertise for women, but they are mostly uh, male workplaces. And um, you can see um, these, these are the, the industries that I, that I give to you. Um, uh, what seems to take place here is that um, there's, there seems to be, uh, you know, there, there's a, it's, it's a quite a mixed bag. So there's, there's an industry of scientific research and development. You could maybe think of that being composed of uh, mainly uh, or more uh, to having occupations that attract uh, women. And, and nevertheless, these workplaces that we look at and classify their male workplaces. So they're, they're all male um, firms that have ventured into a territory that maybe tends to have more and more women. And they advertise now, um, now for women and, and actually manage to signal that. This is definitely true for female workplaces. They're in male industries. That's the panel B uh, at the bottom. Agriculture, forestry, fishing, manufacture of computers, water supply, IT and information services, manufacture of transport equipment. If you are in an industry like that, then you know stating the gender preference is actually quite important because you, you cannot, what people learn from public signals about you is not who you really really are um, um, if, if, if you know the gender composition is not not well known. Now this is you know just going back about how um, the this law has affected the dynamics of gender composition in different firms. So we have the lagged share females here and I don't have the error term at the end of course that's also very important and then there's a coefficient beta and then on the left-hand side, we have uh, age. That's the, whether you hire woman one or uh, zero if you don't. And so what the way to think of this law and its impact on segregation is just to look at different 
uh, betas that we calculate over the different years. And this is something we've done um, for 2000 until 2010. And one thing you can see is that this beta tends to be fairly stable in the pre-period. And then, um, uh, then, then, then it, it definitely decreases substantially uh, during the period when the law is implemented, 2004 and, and henceforth. So what does this mean that beta decreases? It means that the current gender composition plays less of a role for what the firm is going to hire. And we interpret, we think of, of this law having contributed to it. So, so it, it did weaken the, the link between the gender composition of the workplace and, and the current hire. I'd, like, I'd just like to wrap up with some statements of what we find and then also uh, one implication. So st state the gender preference looks very effective if you look at the descriptives of it. If you have data on vacancies and what they say they'd like to have, and it's like in China, even in Austria, um, uh, uh, firms basically got what they asked for. But this is not really saying that state the gender preference has a very strong effect on segregation because we don't know whether firms hire just based on occupation, like Thomas suggested. So they once they they need uh, somebody with that uh, background, uh, you know, in an occupation that is more female type. So they use a female signal and then a male signal. And at the end of the day, they're, they're very, very integrated. So, so, so the reason, so, so that's why we think it's important to look at how the actual system affects um, segregation. And the way we did it is, is something that where we basically identify firms through their industry. And what we find is that those firms that would have hired women prior to the ban are no longer do so. I haven't shown you that. There's some regional differences that work stronger outside Vienna because the labor markets are more separated there as uh, in cities, they're more, more, are more equal. And um, firms that mostly hire women appear uh, less affected. But one thing we, we that's, that's a new result, you know, that one thing we, we think is important is that these kinds of gender statements, they're not uniquely uh, to be outlawed. Uh, there are some strategies that uh, organizations have that actually bring us towards equality that are no longer feasible. And those are the ones for of the integrating firms that, that, that advertise for a type of worker that has a different gender than the current uh, uh, majority. So, so, uh, so one, one policy conclusion, and you know, I, we have to qualify this, you know, one policy conclusion is, you know, those gender statements that we do have right now, a, a conditional quality, um, they, they seem to be very important in, in the way towards, towards integration. Of course, the qualification is we need to better understand what, 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 uh, what integration does to firms, to the workers that work, you know, in very uh, different workplaces and so on. So, and and that's, that's basically the, the parts of the puzzle that we are still looking at. But, but, but this uh, gender preference statement definitely um, uh, seems to have affected segregation in Austria. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We probably have questions. time for maybe one question, if there is Can any question. Question? Sure. One, one thing about this, I mean, certainly replacement of one worker by another, um, only a subset of these cases you're looking at, but they might be kind of an interesting subcase to look at. Um, so if there's a case where you can see where it's likely that you can attribute the, that one worker is leaving around the time that a new worker gets hired, it might be interesting to see whether in those cases there is kind of a replacement of somebody, a man by a woman or vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, yeah, thank you. I, I think there's a lot to do in, with this data and, and we have only scratched the surface. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so may, may I ask a, yeah. may, may I ask a, a last question? So, so it's very convincing what you showed about what is going on within the public employment services. But I was wondering about what is going on for the hires outside of it and whether, 
enforcement of the ban was much stronger in the public employment services than elsewhere, so that you have like a, a substitution of the segregation pattern, which would go like uh, from the public employment services to like other uh, recruitment. So, uh, so, so I, I, I worry about the same thing. And at this stage, I don't think we can say, uh, we can say that the, the, the public employment service definitely abolished the information. But then I could argue, you know, the caseworker knows the firm. So if they've always been asking for yeah. men, they could still uh, work, work on that. And the other thing is that, that, uh, that literally in Austria, the, the, the gender signals have, I believe they have disappeared. I need to do some more work here. But, but, but you know, we, we know the Austrians. If they say something, they do it. And yeah. it took it some time for these signals to disappear. So, so, but, but I have to think about this much more. So, so that, that, that's, uh, that, that's... So, 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 so one suggestion that uh, I was thinking of when you were presenting is that you can at least change the outcome, not, lo not looking only at the hires of women within the public employment services, but as you have the data for the firms, you, you also know what is a change in the workforce composition of the firm without conditioning on the hiring becoming coming from the public employment services. So at least on the sample of firms who are using the public employment services, you can show whether uh, there is uh, also this pattern of uh, uh, like uh, less segregation for any type of prior. That would be already like a first step, I think. Yeah. Uh, Rafael, I wanted to add one word and then perhaps we can discuss later, but in a sense, it, one, Unfortunately, you don't have patients, but then you have this low converge. So in a sense, you seem to implicitly ascribe everything to the fact that firms have different preferences and then the, 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 the rules of changes, you know, their decision set and they cannot really sort of, you know, they cannot hire only men or women. But potentially the fact that, for example, these occupations, so these, in, these firms happen to become less segregated or more male or female than they were, so they might, they might induce different applications because people will have different preferences for how genderized a workplace is, and that's what you might be capturing in, the, in those slow trends. So that's, that's what I had in mind, but we can talk about this later. And um, at this point, Thanks very much for the talk.